All right, so in part one of this Lab 7 video, we went over the call center simulation from Chapter 5, which is a very complicated simulation, has a lot of things going on, and has a lot of interesting visualizations that make the simulation useful during runtime, not just afterwards when collecting stats. So you're going to get a chance to practice building a more realistic simulation, although maybe not as complicated as the call center simulation, but it at least should make you more familiar with things like these visualization tools. So the model that we're focusing on is the SS inventory simulation, and so this is one of these popular inventory management problems. We've already talked about some inventory management problems during lecture. The basic idea is that you have demand that comes in every day. So there's a random amount of demand. And by a amount of demand, what I mean by that is a random number of orders come in every day. So you have some inventory. When the orders come in, you have to deplete the inventory to service those orders. If the inventory is not available, then either you might lose those orders or you might lose the customer in the future. So there is some cost to having negative inventory or back orders. So then what you need to do is determine how often do you check your inventory and at what level do you try to maintain for that inventory. And that's what this kind of captures. So we have these two variables, little s and big S. And we say that every day the inventory is monitored. And during that uh, monitoring, they count up all of the inventory. And if the inventory is less than little s, they order enough to bring the inventory directly up to big S. So in other words, they order big S minus little s new items. Now, when you order those new items, they don't arrive immediately. They have a certain uh, lead time that you have to deal with. Now, and you also, so you have no idea how much demand is going to come in each day, and you have no idea how long it's going to take for your orders to come back. And that complicates figuring out how to set little s and big S. And so this simulation is supposed to help us figure out how to set those parameters. In a later homework, so the last homework that you'll do, you're going to use the tools that you have built up and the knowledge that you've built up to try to provide an answer to that. Which level of little s and big S do you need to pick for this model? But in this uh, lab, we're just going to build the model. I'm not going to have you actually do that analysis or that optimization. But you should at least see where that's coming from. So we're going to start in part one, just following section 5.7. So go to section 5.7 in your book and build this SS inventory simulation using only these uh, basic arena elements. And so what I mean by that is I'll go over into arena here. And so here is... Maybe I'll get move myself. And so here is the model that you'll end up building. Yours, yours will look a little different. You may not have all of these embellishments. Uh, you might put your blocks in different places. But you're basically going to have all of these same blocks. You're going to have this plot that's up here and these different inventory level monitors up, up here. So if I were to run this thing, then uh, and I'll pause it somewhere here then maybe that's got a bad place to pause. I'll pause and there we go. So what this is showing you here is the inventory is currently in the red. And so that's this inventory level. It shows me the inventory is in the red at this instant in time, but this shows the history. The inventory started high and then it declined. It declines because we get demand. Demand depletes the inventory. And then there is some interval in which we check the inventory and order up. Now we might order up but we get more demand calls and it takes a while for those to come back in. And so then the inventory doesn't get properly replenished. And so maybe the fact that this is so negative so often is an indicator that we should uh, order sooner. So maybe our little s should be bigger or maybe we should order more. So our big s should be bigger. Or another parameter, what I haven't talked about, is maybe we should check the inventory more often. Or maybe we should find a new supplier that has a smaller lead time. Or maybe we need to invest in faster shipping, et cetera, et cetera. So those are all sorts of operational parameters you can imagine optimizing with this thing. Now, how does this work? So... Now notice these blocks are a little funny looking compared to the blocks that you've been using in the past two labs. They're not taken from the basic process and in the advanced process panels. They're taken from the blocks 
and Elements panel. And so these are sort of ancient uh, panels from Arena that the book is making you use so that you better understand the wide range of things that you can build in Arena. Arena is built on this programming language called Siman. It's kind of a simulation programming language and it's very full featured like most programming languages are. Arena is kind of a graphical front end to Siman and the basic and advanced process blocks and the advanced transfer block as well that you're now more familiar with. Uh, are kind of limited versions where they implement things in Siman, but maybe they don't do everything that Siman does. Now, if you wanted to actually do everything that Siman does, then you've got these blocks and elements uh, panels here that go into much more detail. And so that's what you're going to build these in just to become familiar that these are available. Although you'll be probably using the basic and advanced process blocks for most of the other models you build, including your final project. Now, one weird thing about these, uh, these blocks is that things that you normally would find in run setup, like our replication parameters, are not going to be found there. There is a block down here called replicate, and if I drill down into it, that's where the replication parameters are. So you can see that it runs one replication, there's 24 hours for, per day, um, and it is uh, going to run... Um, for days to run amount of time and days to run is defined under variables so under days to run it runs for almost 120 days and it will tell you in the book why it does 119.9999 so uh, so things are located in a little different place but again when you run the thing you run it all the same way so i want you to build this and then after you build it i'll want you to run it all the way to completion and then when it's done running to completion, I want you to grab a snapshot of what you built showing the time series that you've run. And that will end up being what's reported in your Word document for part one. And then you'll also save this as, uh, as a DOE file that you'll also upload with your submission. Now, the last thing that I want to mention here before we move on to part two is roughly how this model works, because it is a little bit different because there's things running in parallel. So there's basically a demand section, and so there's a create block here that creates the customer demand. Every day, it, it basically creates a random amount of demand. And so we, this demand ends up subtracting from the inventory. So that's basically what this create block is doing, is it's saying that we're going to get one uh, demand, one order, and then that order is going to have... Um, and uh, if we look under the assign block here, it has this demand size here. And so demand size is actually located under this expressions block. And under demand size, we can see that it draws from a discrete distribution of either one, two, three, or four. And each one of them have a different probability. So if we recall disk here, uh, ends up being a CDF. So what we're looking for is kind of like a discrete CDF or an empirical CDF where this is the first point in the CDF, this is the second point in the CDF, the third point, and the fourth point. And so it's going to draw a random demand at every day and it's going to subtract that from the inventory level and then get rid of that uh, demand. So this dispose block, it's hard to kind of physically interpret what it's doing there. This middle block here is actually the evaluator. So you can imagine demands are running in parallel with an evaluator. Uh, Bucky, I think, is the name they use in the book. And Bucky comes at a, some evaluation interval. In this case, it's also a day. And Bucky then checks the inventory every day and decides whether to order up. So you've got these two things running in parallel. You've got demand coming in, sucking away from the inventory, and then Bucky coming in and making these orders. And you'll see that there is a delivery lag, which then F, after Bucky decides how much to order, using that logic that we've already described, then that order that Bucky decides on ends up not actually getting added to the inventory till after a delay. So that's what you're seeing depicted here. Okay, so if we go back to the PowerPoint, you'll save that file as Lab 7 Part 01, 
then you move on to part two. And I hope you understand the logic that we just went through because in part two, you're going to be building that same logic using those other blocks, those uh, basic process and advanced process panel blocks. So effectively what you're gonna do is start, keep this model in mind with the blocks and elements, but instead of using the blocks and elements panels, you're going to use the basic process and advanced process panels. And I think most everything will be in the basic process panel. I could be wrong, there might be a couple of things in the advanced process, but most everything will be in the basic process panel. And you'll basically create the same sort of logic here. So you'll reconstruct this logic, you'll reconstruct this logic, and you'll reconstruct these parameters here. So instead of having a replicate block, you'll end up having to build that under run setup and so on. So you should be able to replicate all of that, and that also includes using these visualizations. Now I didn't mention how to use the visualizations. The visualizations will be the same in both. You can find all these visualization components up here. So you can see, like if I uh, mouse over these, I see scoreboard, variable, level. These two things, these are actually two levels. One of them is upside down. So this one's only showing positive inventory. This one's only showing negative inventory. And then I've got a histogram and then a plot. And that's what this plot is over here. And then there's some other things you can check out as well. Uh, Q resource, uh, etc. If you were to then drill down into this plot, then you can see kind of similar to a plot in Excel, you've got a data series. And so you can select what you want on this plot. And it's plotting two things, the non-negative inventory and the non-positive inventory. It could color them differently. It's showing you the expressions that represent these things. And so this is a max. Basically, the non-negative inventory takes the maximum of the inventory level and zero. The non-positive inventory takes the minimum of the inventory level and zero. And so those things plotted together, that's what allows this to show a black line when the inventory is positive and a red line when it's negative. So uh, that's how you configure the plots. It'll be similar with the inventory levels. You drill down into here, and unfortunately the way VMware renders this with the, my current settings for fonts and things, it's hard to read this, but it's similar where you're taking the max of the inventory level in zero, and uh, you're depicting it as a black bar. And so just as a reminder, when we run this thing, that's what it looks like. And so these will be configured very similarly in part one and part two, but you'll use very different blocks down here for part two. Okay. So once you do all of that, and I would say your goal, if you're working in the lab with the TAs, is to get through part one and build a correct and working flowchart. After that, uh, and if you have time, you know, it's good to maybe start on this, but if you can get through this on your own and understand what's going on, you should be okay with part two on your own um, afterward. But, um, so that's why I'm saying that's your in-lab goal. So again, what you're submitting is a Word document, which is gonna have two snapshots, a snapshot of the part one using the older blocks and the part two using the newer blocks. Both of these should show plots with data inside them. So let them run all the way to completion so that we can see that your models run and that you're generating data off your own model and you'll then upload that Word doc and so upload the Word doc we need that. If you can it's also very helpful for us if you can upload that a PDF along with that. I'm only requiring the Word doc but if you can also upload that PDF it actually makes grading a lot easier. And then also upload both of the DOE files, the inventory model using the old blocks and the inventory model using the new blocks. And then that, as usual, is due at the usual time. So if you have any questions, let your TAs know, let me know, post on the discussion boards, and hopefully this helps you get more in depth on the complicated things that you can do in ARENA.